will, uh, Jeff, you're first up. You can uh, have the, the clicker. Yeah. Hello. Go. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Sarah. Ah, oh, here I am on. Hello, everyone. Okay, you can consider me to be uh, the distasteful palate cleanser between uh, Chris and Sarah on one hand uh, and Elle following me. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to talk about uh, this, uh, this slide I, I, I found is some sort of a... I, I talk a lot of the time about uh, this nightmarish, dystopian future where we're scrabbling around in the post-apocalyptic filth fighting over rat meat. Um, but what I neglect to include sometimes, uh, and I was looking for a slide to kind of convey that, and I think this one, uh, you have, it just, it, uh, I got a sense of probably, you know, the Reese Mogg family uh, canvassing for votes in that dystopian future. So you're doing a great job in the UK. Um, but Dickens, yeah, um, uh, the Dickensian stuff, sorry. Um, the reason I mentioned Dickens, of course, is because um, the situation we're headed into this winter um, is positively Dickensian. Uh, it's terrifying, um, and, uh, and uh, we have to do something about it. Um, I'm Jeff Colley, as Sarah said. I'm the editor and publisher of Passive House Plus magazine. Uh, I've been publishing a green building magazine of one name or another since 2003. Um, and uh, yeah, we cover evidence-based approaches, I suppose, to, uh, to sustainable building and retrofit. A uh, lot of focus on energy performance, but increasingly now on, on other aspects, including uh, embodied carbon, really kind of trying to get into the guts of that subject too. Um, this is just a slide of a Scottish farmhouse, um, and uh, you know, I'm sure this has been, that phrase has been used God knows how many times over the last few years in, in presentations. Winter is coming, and the question is, how do we keep warm uh, without going broke uh, and, and, and cooking the planet? the same time. I know Scotland quite well. Um, I went to university in Stirling and, um, many, many years ago. And in fourth year, I lived in a converted loft flat. Um, I use the word converted loosely. Um, and uh, with a prepayment meter. Um, it was so cold. I came back, I made a mistake in my final year of coming back in January uh, to start working on my dissertation because semester normally start in, start in February. And it was so cold that I remember not just the steam rising off my breath, but off my hands. So when I hear about what's, what's, what's coming this winter, I really worry. And I think the prepayment meter, I remember having to go, you know, the electricity going, you know, I was paying my way through college uh, uh, and uh, sub subsisting very poorly. Um, and uh, I remember the electricity meter going uh, with the storage heating and so on, and then having to run down to the local shop uh, if it was open uh, to try and get another one. Um, and the prepayment meter issue is a significant one to, to be concerned about because uh, at present, 14% uh, of households uh, in the UK, uh, sorry, 14% of households on prepayment meters as of 2019 were self disconnecting at least once a year. That was when energy was cheap compared to where it is now. Uh, you dread to think about where we're going to be heading into this winter. Uh, we have some data on, the, on that situation. You know the, the conventional definition of fuel poverty being about spending more than 10% of your income on, on fuel. Um, we've gone up to almost 7 million households living in fuel poverty in, in 2022 uh, so far, uh, according to the Nas uh, uh, National Energy Action. Um, that's, uh, this is a reference to Kate DeSalencourt, one of our Journalist is writing a, a, a deep, kind of uh, long read piece on this uh, for, for our new issue. That's up from 4 million last year. And NEA, the National Energy Action, um, have uh, been, been getting data back from, from, uh, from people who are suffering in this, in this situation about the kind of coping mechanisms that they're, they're dealing with. So we're, deal we're talking about borrowing gambling and pawning, sending kids to friends and family, no bathing or showering. So, you know, uh, that, that's a, I know it was a joke, but that's a reality as well, unfortunately, for some people. Cold food only, no heat or only one room for an hour, foraging for wet wood, because you can't get dry wood, obviously, and barbecuing indoors. You 
dread to think about the indoor air quality consequences of that. Um, keeping kids off school because the parents can't wash the children's clothes. This actually seems a lot grimmer now that I, uh, now that I actually read it out in front of 400 people. But there is another way. We shouldn't despair. Uh, now, I'm not going to talk. Passive house isn't the only solution we should be looking at for retrofit. Um, and it's challenging to be thinking about this level of depth of retrofit, I know. But you know, with energy prices where they are and with the, the extent of the, of the situation we're in, um, uh, I think we need to be seriously considering this. This is a project in Dublin, uh, Dublin City Council, uh, St. Brickens Court, which was featured many years ago in the magazine. Um, it, it's, it was 21 or 22 uh, 26 square meter bed sits, which were converted into 11 one bed uh, flats uh, of about 60 square meters each. Um, and to the Enerfit standard, which as many of you know, is the passive house standard for retrofit. Now, when we published the article, the actual projected running costs would have been a fraction of what they are now. But what I've done is adjusted them based on the, the current UK price cap for electricity of, I think it's 34 pence for them until April. Um, so in that case, this, this building would be, uh, for, for heating and hot water, £485 per year and um, would have been less than half of that you know, when, when we published it. Um, uh, that's calculated. Um, there is a monitoring study ongoing uh, on, on, on that project. Uh, we're just about to start. This one is an ex extraordinary one, um, uh, just in terms of what was achieved. It's, a, it's a Simon McGuinness is the architect. Uh, it's a certified passive retrofit, um, and uh, you can see there, I mean, the, the, the results kind of speak for themselves. You, you've got extraordinarily low running costs again, 300, 380 euro per year is the, is, the, uh, is the projected. That's for a family of four, I should say. Um, they run the house quite cold. They're happy, I think, in this particular case to, to keep the house um, at kind of 19 degrees from memory, that uh, average temperature. Um, so, uh, but, you know, uh, an interesting example given that, that the neighbor's property was left untouched. And also, um, there was a study on radon levels in passive houses done by, by an academic at uh, Queen's University, um, uh, Barry McCarran, um, who's now gone on to become the chairman of the Passive House Association of Ireland. Um, but he studied radon levels in passive houses compared to other adjacent properties and found generally far low, the radon being, a, 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 as many of you will know, uh, invisible radioactive uh, ga odorless gas, uh, which is the second biggest cause of lung cancer deaths. Um, and the passive houses were found, including this one, uh, were found to have significantly lower radon levels in all cases than the adjacent properties. Um, this one is going to be published in our next issue. It's another Enerfit uh, project, Enerfit Plus, which means an Enerfit with a bunch of renewables. You see the solar PV roof there. Um, and again, you see similar trends um, in terms of the actual uh, usage. This is uh, two people. Um, but they, they work from home and they've got pets um, and, uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're talking uh, that figure of £424 per year does not, uh, that's an estimate based on the actual uh, energy used by the heat pump uh, irrespective of whether it's coming from the grid or from the PV array. Um, this is an interesting retrofit to focus on as well because um, it, it's, uh, sorry, okay. Because the architect focused on um, on using low embodied carbon materials, uh, so it's, it's it's wood fiber insulation. But when we, we commissioned some embodied carbon calculations for this project, um, the PV array on the roof, uh, depending on which array you use, because we're looking at default data for for embodied carbon in this case, because the, the manufacturer didn't have the data, um, was I think probably roughly half of the total emissions of the overall building. Where the draft calculations will be published in full in the new issue, but some, P, the, some PV arrays on the market uh, have, uh, there's one, one model of PV array that has a quarter of the embodied carbon emissions of many of the others. Um, and uh, that's an important consideration that you would miss if you weren't looking at it, uh, if you didn't have the data. Uh, this is the, I'll, I'll whistle through these. This is the, the first certified benefit in the UK by the CEO of the AECB. It's his own house, actually, uh, Andy Simmons. Um, and it's been, you know, that, built, finished in 2009. Um, and in the first 10 years, uh, the average for gas use was 6,900 kilowatt hours per year um, for heating, hot water, and cooking, and that's um, that works out at 690 pounds per year at, at current costs, um, just based on the 10 cent price cap, um, and warm all the time. Key takeaways: um, Look, um, we need to commit to 
proven evidence-based approaches. Um, there are solutions we, we, we know which, which, which work um, and uh, which have been proven to work over, over decades. Passive House being a good example of that. Um, we should be as ambitious as possible, but aim for a range. So, you know, no building left behind should be the mantra. Um, uh, I would be, I'd encourage people to look at uh, Passive House and the AECB standards, which are built with the same engine. So you, you, it's not an all or nothing approach. You could be looking at uh, an incremental approach where you meet one of the AECB retrofit standards, for instance, um, and, uh, and you, could, you never know, you may find yourself able to go closer to Enerfit uh, th th than you'd realized. Um, don't assume that retrofit is low embodied carbon because a lot of the components that are used can actually, you know, we need to quantify this, basically. Um, uh, a lot of the components that are being used um, can have quite a high embodied carbon penalty. There are other issues too environmentally beyond that. Um, but, you know, the key is, as we've done with, uh, with, with, with energy performance, we need to get number crunching, basically, uh, so that we can kind of test out our preconceived notions and see whether they stack up or not, really. Thank you, anyway. Thanks, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. My great, 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 great uncle, Sir Isaac Newton, said for his third law that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. And a Newton's cradle is designed to demonstrate his concept. But we know that the balls don't continue to click in perpetuity because there's other factors at play. There's some heat and obviously some noise. And it's not operating in a vacuum. So although there's a reaction, it's not always where we expect it because it's part of a wider system with lots of interconnected parts. So for, for problems in our sector, like lack of affordable housing, unhealthy buildings and subsequent costs to the NHS, lack of skilled people and the ageing workforce, the energy crisis and of course the climate and biodiversity emergencies, we need to think back to this issue of interconnectedness. What makes a company MMC is that they're often looking to solve these wicked problems and um, by using these systems thinking to help us solve and manage these complex interdependencies. So what is MMC anyway? Well MMC as Roman numerals translates to the year 2100 so based on the snail's pace of change that our um, construction sector evolves perhaps that's the year when we'll start, finally start to adopt modern methods. Seriously though, we know it stands for modern methods of construction, but is it modern? Some of the techniques using panelised and volumetric technologies have been around since the post-war era, so uh, it's not really that much of a new idea. And if modernising the construction industry is a new idea, how come we've had successive reports from Egan and Latham and uh, Mark Farmer, so perhaps next time we need a woman to write a report. Anyway, MMC is an all-encapsulating term for innovative uh, construction methods. So yes, it is all about the method in which we use our resources in the most efficient, sustainable and systematic way possible. So what about the C? construction. may be wrong again. Aren't we talking more about manufactured methods? So thank goodness that we've got a bit of clarity now. We've got the um, MMC definition framework and th that was Mark Farmer who is a great guy and his company Cast and they've defined seven strands of innovative construction enabling designers, clients, lenders and investors, warranty providers, building insurers and valuers all to use this common understanding of the different forms of MMC, ranging from those completely constructed off-site, so volumetric CAT1, all the way through to interventions taking place on-site, so using large modular formats of existing or uh, traditional construction techniques and digital interventions. And things start to get even more exciting, especially if you're a geek like me, when you start to combine some of these categories together. So, for example, if you were to digitally scan a building, which is CAT7, attach, uh, sorry, 3D print bespoke components, which is additive manufacturing, CAT4, for attaching um, new panels or new components to the outside of a building to maybe create a whole house retrofit. And, um, you know, avoiding carbon tunnel vision and thinking about multiple benefits at once, a successful MMC approach looks to address multiple problems at once. So like um, a company I'm going to tell you about called Factory Zero, they create 
um, MEP pods or utility pods. And they use a Japanese technique called kanban, which means push-pull. And they assemble a kit of parts, parts like bespoke cut pipe lengths, battery storage, hot water tanks, and MVHR, unit, MVHR units, all into one high-quality pod. It's plug and play, so it can be assembled, uh, sorry, it can be installed in one day, which means less disruption for the tenant or homeowner. And there's nearly 3,000 of these units already um, produced, and they're being remotely monitored to check and enhance the performance based on user behavior. That's smart. Smart is different to automated because humans are part of the control system. And comfort and well being are at the heart of smart. And integrating this data cap capability into our MMC is absolutely crucial. How can we know if there's a successful outcome if we're not measuring it? The best MMC companies are developing digital passports for their products, and these contain QR codes which have information on who put the product together, what are their skills, capabilities, competencies, and accreditations, when those parts need to be, be replaced, and what's in the kit. And then there's a customer face to this passport. And that face, uh, that uh, digital information, this integration on site, uh, sorry, the uh, interface of this information can be appropriate for the user, be it a 70 year old granny or someone managing a large estate. One size doesn't need to fit all. And there's currently many MMC companies that are actually um, off site companies just constructing in sheds. And they instead need to move to DFMA. Design for manufacture and assembly focuses on the ease of manufacture and the efficiency of assembly, hopefully in the minimum time and at the lower cost. So to clarify the terminology, DFMA is a design discipline, whereas MMC is a group of technical approaches. So DFMA drives the value that we need from MMC and off-site. And if you add a P, you've got PDFMA, Platform Design for Manufacturing Logistics and Assembly, and potential sector transformation. And if you think, I've got no idea what a platform is or its potential impact, well, you only need to look as far as Amazon, Uber, or um, Airbnb for the way their digital platforms have completely transformed retail, hospitality, and personal transport sectors. So to explain what a platform is quickly, all platforms have three things in common. First, like this humble Lego brick, I love a bit of Lego, um, they've got a core, so that the block is the core. Second, the peripherals, which in Lego can be anything from a door and a window or a wheel chassis, right up to all the parts for the Millennium Falcon. And thirdly, the stable interface. And these little knobs on the top are the interface, something to connect the core to the peripherals to provide mass customization. And this idea of using platforms in construction is starting to be explored, but it'll only be exploited if we um, start to use these ideas at scale. And when I visited the Netherlands a few weeks ago, um, I saw, um, I saw a, a whole regeneration scheme, and it was new build homes right next to uh, retrofitted homes. And both of these types of homes had used the same panel manufacturer, and this manufacturer is using the same components for both types of um, building. That is what good looks like. This is the future, an industry that uses integrated digital and physical platforms. So to address wicked problems, we need disruption of the status quo. So who's gonna do it? We are. We must win the hearts and minds, and obviously some cash for investment, but technology isn't the silver bullet. We need, human, we need to have, have people at the heart of our solutions to include human behaviours and the impact of people in our decision making. And although, yes, we need to look to the future, this isn't about predicting the future, but about creating the future we choose. So we need to focus on the outcomes that we want, outcomes like better health and well-being, lower energy bills, inclusive employment opportunities, and obviously reducing our environmental impact. And that's why the obvious choice is to adopt MMC. <clears throat> Morning all, can you hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I didn't know that you were related to Isaac Newton. <laughs> that is, I'm probably going to fanboy over your family tree later on. Remind me to quiz you on that as well. 
so good morning all, Kwam Adewale. I am the industry strategy lead for the built environment sector here at Microsoft UK. And my role is primarily around, number one, how do we increase our external presence in the market? as why I'm here. But also as well, how do I support our commercial teams in understanding the industry narrative and challenges that all of you here experience and face across your businesses, your public sector organizations, and also as well those within academia. Now, I was asked to cover the topic of digital transformation in seven minutes, and I thought, my goodness gracious <laughs> me, how the hell am I gonna do that in seven minutes? So bear with me, hopefully I can cover some elements that are quite pertinent to some of the challenges you're facing, but also as well, talking around how we solve for the net zero challenge. So where do we start? Well, we start in a period of uncertainty, uncertain times. Um, I think uncertainty is a, a synonym for the UK prime ministerial seat at the moment, um, <laughs> with the merry-go-round that's going on. But jokes aside, I think that we've all faced a lot of uncertainty in the last couple of years, whether it's been the global pandemic, more recently with inflation pressures with regards to energy prices, but also as well, in the corporate world, when I speak to board level executives around the challenges that they're facing in the, spirit, in the built environment, there are broader uncertainty challenges such as labor shortages, the inability to skill on time in order to support the incoming demand around new infrastructure, both commercial and non-commercial real estate here within the UK and globally. And in this time of uncertainty, how do we begin to solve, not just for the macro challenges, but also the day-to-day -day problems that enterprises have on a day-to-day -day basis? And that's where we, well, it, at Microsoft, we've coined this term of digital perseverance. It's all around how do we leverage digital capabilities to build that bounce back ability to rebound in times of uncertainty, but also as well to ensure that we are continuing to grow the long-term viability of the customers in which we serve, but also ensuring that we deliver the social outcomes that are needed for the UK economy at large. Now, don't just take my word for it, take, take the word for, from some of, um, some of the executives that we surveyed earlier in this year, where we held a webinar and a roundtable discussion, a number, of, a, a number of tier one contractors in the US. And here were some of the quotes that I just wanted to share with you around what they're seeing in terms of digital trends and capabilities of their organizations. First and foremost, they highlighted that everyone is an information worker, right? Whether you're a frontline worker, guy or girl with a hard hat down on site, whether you're a project manager, a BIM manager, a site manager who's conducting, coordinating construction projects, everyone is an information worker. Why? Because of the proliferation of devices, whether it be smart, smart watches, mobile devices, computers. Our CEO, Sachin Nadella, sort of describes this age that we're in as the age of ubiquitous compute. Computing power is everywhere. Information is everywhere. Connectedness is everywhere. And so everyone can drive differentiated decision-making based upon that information that, that's at their hand. So everybody's becoming a an information worker. And secondly, because of this in in ubiquitous compute and the accessibility of technology, the barrier to entry is lower. So we're seeing smaller companies come in and disrupt the built environment supply chain lifecycle. We're seeing companies come in with smart surveying technologies, new tools for estimation, materials monitoring, digital twin capabilities. And what this is driving is a little bit of confusion in the enterprise world. It's, I need to meet the demands of my business, but I operate in a low margin business, often single digit percentage points. I have regulatory pressures around information management sharing. <laughs> things, things such as the Building Safety Act that are coming around, you know, informing leaseholders around uh, better safety rules around their building assets, but also as well regulatory pressures around the net zero agenda, and rightly so. And how do I manage this complex and nuanced problem space? Well, it's all around leveraging technology, but it's not only technology as, as I'll describe, it's also around that people and cultural change. Here at Microsoft, we look at the built environment in terms of its whole life view of the building asset. So how are we looking at the long-term viability of this space and its utilization in the design and planning phase, all the way through to prefab and logistics, but also as well into the operation and maintenance of that asset. And what do we mean by that? How do we ensure that the design tool and the file format that a BIM manager is leveraging in Autodesk or Bentley can link and work with a project schedule that exists within an Oracle file, or, or, or rightly so, integrates with the existing collaboration tools that you're all used to working with today, whether it be our stack or others. And it's really around how do we drive that open and interoperable, interoperable model to drive the actions and insights that you can then enable to conduct remedial activity, whether it be for climate change or for other activities. 
And what this is enabling is that real-time monitoring of not only building performance, but also as well the way in which we deliver infrastructure projects today. So, let me talk you through a couple of customer examples. One is from our, one of our customers, global civil engineering organization called Atkins, part of SSC Labeling Group, headquartered in Montreal. And what they're doing is leveraging cloud-based technology to conduct 3D modeling quicker to high degrees of quality around water utility assets for their water utility organizations. And again, in a time and materials business, their ability to effectively simulate models in virtual environments quicker means that their engineers have more time per hour to do different tasks, but also as well, it drives up their billable utilization. Not only that, they're able to leverage artificial intelligence and integration capabilities to begin to incorporate and bring, to, bring into their design model measurements around embodied carbon, operational carbon efficiencies around the assets that they're designing for, so that when we enter the build phase, those models and those assets are, are constructed in a more efficient manner. Lastly, I kind of want to touch on another customer example here is uh, Paris F. Clay, a university in, in, in France. Um, one of the points that Chris referenced earlier was the co-benefits of sustainable outcomes. And actually, those co-benefits, I think we can dis distinctly align or relate to commercial benefit. One thing that was evident um, in Chris's presentation earlier on was that if we're going to meet those targets of 2050, 2040, in fact, we're going to need the private sector to come along with us. And I'll, often when I, when, I, when I speak to executives, they say, oh, Quam, you're greenwashing. What's all this rubbish about climate change? But really, if we can link climate change and the benefits of deploying these solutions and capabilities to not only drive operational carbon improvements, but also reduction in cost, that's really where we gather the momentum of the private sector to invest in these type of projects. And again, that's why I would like to draw your attention to this project. This was an IoT-based project based with our partner Cosmotech, where we deployed a numerous numbers of sensors to number one, understand and monitor the energy utilization of said building stock, but then also as well use artificial intelligence to infer decision making around next best action improvement around space occupancy levels, improvements around augmenting different assets in and around rooms, monitoring footfall at different floors or levels in the campus and space. And this was imperative in making us understand and you know, maybe floor A isn't, doesn't have 20, isn't at full capacity. Should we be really turning on all the lights in floor A? And can we defer that energy elsewhere? Or could we use microgrid capabilities to resell some of that energy back to this energy supplier? This is technology that exists today. It's not a challenge around technology. What we often find is bringing an, an, uh, other stakeholders on board. Chris referenced um, uh, policy earlier. But I would actually challenge that it's actually articulating the business case and the business value of some of these technology capabilities to senior st stakeholders to bring them along on that journey, as well as the skills shortage and the skills capability of workers to actually begin to deploy, monitor, and maintain these types of capabilities. You know, I've tried to cover digital transformation in, a, in, a, in, in seven minutes, but happy to field a number of questions in the Q&A. I look around these banners and I see, be, be courageous, be stronger. Um, but the one thing that I'd like to leave you with is be encouraged. The technology can solve for the outcomes that we're looking to, to achieve, but it's more so around the collaboration opportunity amongst all the stakeholders in this room. Thank you very much. That's all for me. Hello, everyone. A bit nervous, so bear with me. Um, I am Patrick Cosgrove, the chair of the Scottish Ecological Design Association. Um, I hope that name's familiar to most of you. But if you're, if you're not, if this is the first time you've ever encountered us, um, we've been around for about 30 years and we are a, a volunteer organisation who are trying to get out information about best practice in ecological and sustainable design. Um, we also ask questions when we think topics aren't being brought up that maybe should be talked about. We provide information, we give case studies, we give you our experience. We're, we're here to help people on their journey for what they want to do. So a couple of quick questions, because I'd like to know more about this audience here. How many of you actually work in construction or in kind of estates management? Just to this audience, hands up please. Quite a lot, that's good, good. Um, have you got a lot of rising costs that are maybe affecting your budgets? and and? Dif difficulties with supply chain, you know, it's, it's been quite difficult now. Is that, is that a common thing, Hans? Is this affecting a lot of you now? Yeah? 
Um, have you got any net zero carbon policies or targets that you have to make on your projects or your work? Yeah? It's starting to become more and more common, and even to the fact of actually putting data on it saying have to hit these targets. Right. How, how can we solve this? We've got all these different challenges. How can we solve them? Well, what if there was a way that we could say, do you know, actually we've got a supply chain, we've got materials to hand, we've got things that have got proven performance, we've got something that's local that we can use, and actually it's got less embodied carbon, so it's going to hit all of these targets. Is that something that would be really interesting? Is that something you can sign up to? And you go, of course you can. Yeah, that's great, fantastic. How can we do that? What's the answer? The answer is reuse. We've got so many materials in the built environment in Scotland that people don't value. And whenever something changes, the automatic reaction is demolish and start again. Because there's always materials, isn't there? It just, you just go and buy more. But there aren't enough resources in the planet to keep doing that. And we're, we have to start a big retrofit program. I mean, that's had to happen. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. But the first step in retrofit is actually repair. There's no point in retrofitting a building that's got a leaky roof. There's no point in adding insulation to something which is still really drafty because it's not well maintained. So there's a certain amount of repair you've got to do first before you think about the benefits of the retrofit. So that's even more materials that we need. But we've got a huge amount of buildings. And actually the first step would actually be reuse those buildings, don't build new buildings, but it's maybe a bit controversial today. So we'll, we'll skip that one. That's maybe another conference topic. Reuse of materials, anything that has to be taken down can be taken apart. And look around this building here, everything, just about everything here can be taken down and reused in another building. And that has value, but it only has value if you, if you can recognise it. So the first step is actually thinking, how can you use materials? Don't just automatically default to starting again. So let's... This isn't a new thing for CEDA. CEDA have been I say, around for about 30 years, and the, the very first design guide that we came up with was the design guide for... De for deconstruction. In fact, the author may even be in the audience today. Hello, Chris. Um, and this basically looks at the whole thing to say, right, okay, here's all the good reasons for doing it. And not only that, but here's some practical ways to do it. In fact, actually, you should be designing so things get taken down because that maximizes the value of your materials. And the more that you can do that, the easier it is to change. And that, we don't know what's coming down the line. So actually, change is something that you have to factor in. So, we still think this is very valid. I mean, 17 years ago when we wrote that, equally as valid today. Probably could do with a wee bit of a refresh, but actually we want to do that. We want to bring this to more people. Freely available on our website, go look for it. Um, but this is about inspiration. This is about trying to, this whole sector is about inspiration, trying to give you um, ideas for what is possible. So I'm going to give you three examples of good inspiration that I think need to be widely known and maybe will spark an idea from people in the audience. First, local, local good news story, egg lighting. May even be here today, I'm not even sure if they are. Um, if anybody's heard about them, they, they are looking at remanufacturing of light fittings. So whenever a building comes to the end of its life and you're taking things apart, or whenever you're just doing upgrades to LED lighting, the standard way of doing things, take out the old fittings, take them away, put new fittings in, whatever happens to the bits that are taken out, someone else's problem. But they're going, well, that's quite a valuable resource. And most of that light fitting is still quite valid. It's just the, light, the lamp in it, just the control part of it that isn't actually as efficient as it could be. So what if you just repaired that bit, replace that one bit of the whole thing that isn't necessarily working well, the rest of it's fine. So you're not starting from scratch, you don't need all those materials, and actually you've got a guaranteed supply chain because we're in the middle of a big refurbishment process. So why not remanufacture rather than starting from scratch? And then you go, well, you know, that's a good idea. In fact, that should be the default position of everything. So if you look at it in terms of that, then actually all of our m and could be remanufactured. And we're about to go through a big retrofit process, so one of the things maybe we should consider is nothing should be thrown away, but can it be changed to then be the new fittings that we need? And another thing that, again, we're at the early stages of considering this, but they're considering lighting as a service so that you don't buy your light fittings and that's the end of the journey. You just have to use them until they're not, no longer needed. But what they provide is lighting. You buy that service of lighting. So they, they keep ownership of the light fittings. If you need anything changed or maintained, they will do it. At the end of that light fitting's life, they can take it back. So they've got that resource to put back into their own chain. So they don't need to keep looking for new materials. They actually have the materials. 
And I, I know that this has been looked at in other industries as well. It's been looked at for ventilation. It's been looked at for carpets. Carpets leased rather than carpets bought. Now there's an interesting thought. If you were in a commercial offices and tenants change every 10 years, first thing that new tenants do is they replace everything inside. And then anything that gets taken out, it's part of that refit, skip it, somebody else's problem. But what if you were just leasing those carpets? So whenever they moved out, somebody comes in and takes the carpets away. You go, oh, right, okay, then you can use it again. But how can you do that? Well, first of all, don't glue it to the floor. Anybody who's ever tried to uh, retrofit a 1970s office block will tell you, ripping a carpet that's been stuck down to the floor is a nightmare job, and it destroys everything. So you have to think about how do you install? How do you construct to let you take things apart and reuse them? Because that keeps the value in that asset, and in environmental and sustainable terms, it can keep being used. So I'll give you inspiration number two. Um, some of you might have heard, Rotor DC, um, they're a company in Belgium, really interesting company. Um, they take buildings apart so they can get the components. Now initially they just actually started out as a, as a research organisation trying to find other companies that did salvage materials. And that just to make that link available to the general public. And they gradually evolved into taking buildings apart. And then they realised the more that they did that, that there were new techniques that needed to be developed. So for instance, they found a way to be able to dissolve grout from floor tiles, so that you could take floor tiles off. Something that you would think couldn't be recycled actually can be taken up and used again. So what they've got is they've got an online shop and they've got warehouses where they store all these materials. And it's something that the Belgian government thought was a good idea. So they were saying for any of their own office buildings or, um, that were been taken down, they should try and salvage any materials from them. Of course, the next step to that is actually to say, that for any new builds or any refurbishments, you should try and use a percentage of reused materials. And that's quite critical because that starts to stimulate a market. And that's, at the moment, we've got a lot of policies that said circular economy, you need to get into construction. How can you make that happen? One of the ways you make that happen is you make it a planning requirement and you make it a Scottish government policy requirement for any projects that get Scottish government money. 10% re reused materials in your building, straight away that's 10% of less new materials that you need. You're preventing something from going into the waste um, side of things. And actually you can have a bit of fun with it. You know, you can get a bit of character by reusing materials. There's all sorts of ways that you can think about it and go, oh, do you know, this could be something unique and different. Interesting, for a designer they always like unique and different. But it, it sets up the, the, the whole idea of buildings as material banks, which is, a really, really interesting side of things. And it's where the digital twins and all the digital modelling of information, materials, passports, all start to come together into this. Because if you knew that certain buildings were getting taken down and the materials were coming available, then that could be of real interest to people who then have to repair, remake, or change things around. Setting that up <coughs> from scratch is something that we're going to have to try and do. But as I say, these are an example where it works. Can we scale that? Can we have some rebuilding merchants rather than building merchants. I'd like to see that across Scotland. Um, inspiration number three, um, some of you maybe have seen this before, um, whole scale um, reuse of components. The, the Lead Anchor Group from Denmark are really interested because they're trying to um, make projects reusing materials and <coughs> embodying um, the, the use of reuse as much as possible. This is one of the most famous ones. This is the Resource Rose Housing in Copenhagen. Um, and they try to find as many materials as possible that they could reuse. So about 30% of the materials in this, these buildings are reused. And the most obvious one is the bricks on the outside, which came from Carlsberg Brewery warehouses. <coughs> they, they were able to, to take these apart in small sections, um, use them in different ways as cladding, um, and actually it gives a real character to the whole thing and a good, good story. But they also did things like that there are... Um, they reuse windows, they reuse timber. They <laughs> Thank you very much. Before I start coughing, coughing. They, they, re they reuse an awful lot of things, including concrete beams, which became a bridge externally. And you're thinking, oh, that's really very creative. But actually, they said, well, this should be business as normal. This should be the types of things that every building can do. But you go, okay, right, we can have a bit of fun with this. So uh, I'm just trying to show that there are examples there that show that there are innovative ways to be able to reuse materials, that it's not a boring thing, it's not a target you have to meet, it's ways where you can go, right, what can we do, how, how can we bring our 
the skills and experience through this. So we're trying to get across here is that there are many different ways to have a sustainable impact. And one of the ways I'd like you to consider is how can you reuse what we already have? Because rather than just coming up with completely new ways of doing things, maybe what you do is consider how you make better use of what you've got. I work on an awful lot of conservation projects and I tell you, almost every single one of my drawings says on it, carefully take down and set aside for reuse. It's a kind of phrase that is, applies to just about everything now. So I would say, what is good conservation practice? I would say I should apply to all construction. So on that note, I would like to say, please consider what you already have, how you use it, and that's probably the biggest sustainable impact you can have with the least amount of effort. That's me. Thank you. Thank you.